Hello, Sunshine. I'm Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. This week, we'll be talking the MLS Supporters Shield uh, situation going on, uh, some EPL ridiculousness in the best sense of the word. Zlatan keeps Zlataning. Uh, a potential 2023 Men's World Cup, question mark? Derbies, Fatal Vision, and so much more. But first, joining me, as always, my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. Mossy, how are you doing on this? We are recording Monday, October 19th in the year 2020. I am doing well and I have a little story to tell. Ooh, that's always good for a show that requires content. Lay it on me, my friend. Last Wednesday, I achieved, um, I don't want to exaggerate here, but probably the greatest feat in the history of mankind. Wow. If it's all, it, it's, that's it. You've, you've run your course then. Well, let me hear how, uh, what the, uh, the, uh, the pinnacle is here. My buddy Jordan and I took a little adventure. Uh, we walked from Santa Monica to downtown LA and back, which for those of you unfamiliar with the geography there, that's about a five hour walk one way. And then on the way back, because you're tired, your pace slows down. It was more than a six hour walk back uh, there were a couple stops for food along the way. So ended up being an, a full day activity. We left early in the morning, came back late at night. It was just something we've been talking about doing and we wanted to do it just to kind of test our endurance. And also we thought it'd be kind of a neat little look at L.A. and perhaps parts that we don't normally uh, visit. Well, uh, you know, to quote uh, uh, the great Berlin um, a band that you have probably no clue uh, about. Uh, nobody walks in LA, but you are proving that wrong. Now, uh, uh, and you, you mentioned it a little bit. I want to make sure I understand. Was this a, a, a Forrest Gump-esque type of uh, epic adventure that you had talked about and that you were trying to discover something either about yourselves or about the great city of Los Angeles? Yeah, I had that feel. Yeah. I mean, the thing that really struck me um, on the walk there was you really get a sense for how diverse a city like L.A. is. We passed so many different neighborhoods uh, with people of different ethnicities. And, and that was kind of fascinating. Uh, on the way there, you get to really appreciate the scenery and take it all in. Um, on the way back, you start to get pretty tired and your feet are killing you. And then it's just about finishing something you started and you're not really sort of taking it all in anymore. But yeah, the way the way there was really interesting to pass through all these different neighborhoods in Los Angeles. I don't think I'm alone in saying I could talk for the next hour about this. I uh, my, you are my I have so many questions, but I'm going to limit it to this. Um, wh what was your apparel? Are you one of these walkers? Have you ever seen the walkers that have the actual I don't even know what they call them. There's probably a cool name for them, but, the, but like the ski poles that they that they use on either side when people are walking. You've ever seen these people when you're hiking and stuff, they have ski poles or anything. No, I did. The one uh, my, my buddy Jordan had done this once before. So he's something of an expert on the subject now. And he, he told me to bring hiking shoes. And so I did wear hiking shoes instead of regular shoes. And that that proved to be a, a very smart choice, because like I said, my feet were killing me anyway at the end of it. But I can't even imagine if I hadn't been wearing hiking shoes. But other than that, just normal T-shirt, shorts, uh, hat and sunglasses, too, because it was a very sunny day. So I did not uh, put any sunblock on. So I was I was very red afterwards. But uh, for the most part, I, I came through it OK. Well, God, I wish that I had had cameras rolling. I mean, this is a perfect documentary-esque type of thing to, you know, the walk uh, and then the conversation that, the, that you had. So I ended up being around 11. You mentioned you stopped for some food. Now, I know that's very important. Uh, how, how did you decide where and when to stop? Um, for lunch, we sort of had a place in mind that's Got right it. before you get downtown, this Greek place, delicious, uh, in honor of you. Um, and then <laughs> dinner was just kind of, uh, we, we were initially, the plan was to try to make it home all the way, but, but it was taking longer than we anticipated and we were both starving and it was just kind of a, you know, you find some place nearby. We were, we were both uh, pretty desperate for some food. So that wasn't all that planned out. Uh, but yeah, listen, th there were many people in my life that doubted I could pull this off because, as you know, I don't live the healthiest life. I, I, I live alone. I don't cook. I, I more or less subsist on a diet of pizza and hamburgers, and I drink a lot of soda and, and beer. Uh, but I proved them all wrong, as I've been doing throughout my whole life. You know, I, 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 always, I always seem to prove the doubters wrong. <laughs> Congratulations, my friend. Uh, that is, uh, that is a, <clears throat> that's a feather in your, in your cap, uh, for sure. I'm glad you made it back in one piece. Uh, and I can already see that you are a changed person for having gone on this uh, 
this vision quest through <laughs> through Los Angeles. All right. Um, I know we talk a lot about what we watch and what we digest from an entertainment perspective. I got a, a podcast recommendation for the folks out there. Um, it's called Morally Indefensible. And I found it on Spotify. It might be on the other uh, the uh, platforms out there. But it centers around um, the, uh, you know, I'm a big true crime type of guy. And it centers around the Jeffrey McDonald case, which happened back in 1970. Um, a, a, a former Green Beret and doctor was accused and then ultimately convicted of killing both his wife uh, and his kids. He, for years, has maintained his innocence. Uh, you know, the reason why it, just that in and of itself would interest me. But then there was a huge book that came out of it by the late uh, author Joe McGinnis called Fatal Vision. And this takes a look not necessarily at the actual murder because that has been, and, and, the, and the, the court cases involved, because that has been gone over time and time again. And, and it, does, it does focus on that, but it, it looks at it with the lens of the journalistic ethics of Joe McGinnis, um, the author of this book, in the way that he went about getting the information. I'm not gonna spoil it for you if you don't know, but in a, in a nutshell, uh, this was an author who uh, formed a partnership, uh, a, 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 uh, signed a contract with the then accused um, murderer and to write a book. And the book came out and Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey McDonald, the, um, the Green Beret and the murderer, um, did not like the way that it portrayed him. And it goes into how he was able to gain the trust of this guy and whether it was ethically appropriate and uh, so many other questions. It also is a companion piece, uh, evidently on, uh, I think the FX network um, has done a, a multiple episode type of companion piece called A Wilderness of Error. So if you can find that, you can you, you can do it. Uh, that in and of itself uh, would have would have been interesting enough for me, but I actually have crossed paths with the late Joe uh, McGinnis. He actually came and visited me many years ago when I was living in Italy, and we spent oh gosh a week probably together. Uh, he was researching some stuff for uh, a story that he was going to write. He ended up not only uh, hanging out there, but falling in love with American soccer. And for those of you that are into American or books about soccer, you will know uh, the miracle of Castel de Sangre, the um, the book that he wrote, and uh, about a soccer team, a low-level soccer team in Italy, and the corruption involved. And he fell in love with the game. And I kept up with him. Uh, right up to right up to his death, and um, it, it's really just interesting to see this and to see this character who I said I crossed paths with, and it's already a famous uh, story. But also, in in this day and age where media and press and is at times redefined um, or differently defined, what we consider appropriate when it comes to news and facts and opinion uh, and debate and all of that kind of stuff when it goes into the, uh, the art and the skill and the profession that is uh, writers and, uh, and media folks out there. So I recommend that, uh, that highly, it's really, it's really good. Even if you don't know anything about this case and there's plenty of you out there that don't, it's just, that in and of itself from a true crime perspective is really, really good. So check that out. Anything Mossy before we uh, light this candle? Well, I will definitely check that out. Believe it or not, I do listen to your recommendations on this podcast. I, I watched and listened to a slew of things this past week. I won't go through all of them because it's already a beefy opening segment, but just mentioned two that were on your recommendation. Uh, I did watch A Perfect Crime, the Netflix documentary about the assassination of that German official. Mm -hmm. uh, loved it. Thought it was fascinating. Uh, so we can get into it on a different uh, different time. And then I also listened to the Silvio Berlusconi uh, documentary that you mentioned. Bunga Bunga. Yeah. And I found that very, very entertaining as well. It is. I mean, and there's there's all sorts of uh, you know, interesting parallels to what's going on now, and and, and all that. So uh, good. Well, I'm glad that you that you listened to me. I don't know if anybody else out there uh, does, but we like to throw those out. All right, we got plenty to get to because all sorts of stuff happened over the last uh, week. You ready to light this candle, Mossy? Yep. All right, we're going to start off uh, over in uh, in Europe, where there was not only action when it comes to we'll, go, we'll straight we'll start with the EPL um, there was ridiculousness as I said in the in the greatest form in terms of the un, in uh, the 
what is it? Unpredictable or uh, unpredictable types of results that we saw, the way in which those results came about. Uh, and there's so many to get to. Christian Pulisic, from an American perspective, back on the field, that is a good, that is a positive uh, starting for Chelsea, remained healthy uh, by all uh, accounts, did not get hurt. Uh, so that's that's all good checks of boxes. He, he still looked dangerous. Uh, he was involved in goals, still taking players on. Uh, I don't think that that this return to actual play changed anybody's view about how important he is, not just to Chelsea. And then from an American perspective, uh, how good he is and how talented and um, incisive he is when he gets on the, uh, on the ball. Then you add the fact that this was just a, a nutty game that ultimately Chelsea ended up uh, only getting a point out of. They will certainly feel like they should have gotten uh, that they should have gotten three against Southampton. It ended up three to three, uh, and not the only nutty game out there. But uh, anything to say on that one, uh, Mossy? No, I, I agree with everything you said. Pulisic played very well. Made a beautiful play on the third goal, uh, Havertz, the, which gave Chelsea the lead again after they had squandered a two goal advantage. But as you mentioned, they then surrender a uh, late equalizer. Uh, yeah, no issues for Chelsea going forward. I mean, they are going to be a devastating attacking team this season. Timo Werner with two goals. Uh, the first one I thought was absolutely gorgeous. That little dummy spin he did. He looked a little team. more Werner-esque. I mean, you know, with, with, with what we've come to expect, and obviously having watched him for years in, in the Bundesliga, he, he was, he still had, we still hadn't seen him kind of have those, those not just moments, but games. And I think this was one of those games where you kind of saw why, why he was bought for that amount of money and why he has been so highly sought after. Yeah. The issue of course is at the back. Now, mm -hmm. to be fair, they have sort of the goalkeeper situation. It's just that Mendy's injured right now. So Kepa's still having to play and he made a terrible mistake on Southampton's second goal, but hopefully once uh, Mendy gets in there, hopefully if you're a Chelsea fan like Alex Dowd, uh, he'll at least sort out the goalkeeper position, but they still have to figure out the defenders there. But uh, yeah, still some work to do for Frank Lampard, but a uh, very, very talented team for sure. This Chelsea team, they do produce some beautiful football when they have the ball. Uh, they do, but they did not come away with the three points. And, you know, that's, that's problematic for them. But like you said, if they shore up the defense, th those, you, you think, you hope, uh, if you're a Chelsea fan, obviously, that uh, that, that will get sorted out. Uh, not the only 3-3 three, three results. So we go on to the other 3-3 three, three result, Mossy. Mossy, does that sound good? Absolutely. All right. So Spurs West Ham, <laughs> this was a tale of not just two halves, but two, two moments, uh, bookends of the game. Uh, so much so that Son scored in, what, the first 40 seconds uh, of the game. Uh, Spurs went out. It was just going to be by all accounts, a route. They go up three, nothing, uh, dancing, having a good time. Everybody's smiling. Uh, Mourinho's uh, finally, you know, turned the corner. This is back. This is uh, the, the glory times are, are, are back again. And then somehow it just completely goes to, you know what? And in the last 15 minutes, they, <laughs> they conspired to have a, just this epic meltdown and ultimately ends up, uh, ends up three to three uh, own goal here. Okay. I get it, but um, it's still some defensive issues. I, somebody had asked me maybe on a couple of pods ago, if I thought that, or maybe it was on Twitter, if I thought that the art of defending was going away. So it's a bigger, it's a bigger conversation right now, but certainly the art of defending in the EPL is going away. Uh, and we'll talk more about the importance, therefore, maybe the greater significance and importance of defenders uh, in, in a little bit here. But all right. So that three to three one. What were your thoughts on that one? This was such a roller coaster on Twitter, because, as you mentioned, Tottenham jump out to that three nil lead. Uh, Harry Kane and, and Hungman son, that, that's the best one two punch in the league right now. The understanding they have with each other uh, and, and, and Spurs are just playing some beautiful football. And, and, and Twitter was just going nuts. And, and oh, Mourinho was shoving it back to his critics. And this notion that he was washed up is ridiculous. And he's still the special one. And because of the events that took place in Goodison Park, which we'll, we'll talk about in a minute, which, which people feel like has thrown this Premier League race completely wide open again, there was even some Tottenham might win the Premier League this season buzz for about 60 minutes there on Twitter. And then what happens, happens last uh, 10 minutes. Uh, and it, it, now I don't know what to think, but I, I mean, I, I'm inclined to just say this was a fluke, kind of how I interpreted that Liverpool 7-2 defeat to Aston Villa. I don't know what you could read from this other than just sometimes crazy stuff happens. 
Uh, I'm still very high on this Tottenham team. I picked them to finish in the top four, even before those late signings of Reguilon and, and Bale and Carlos Vinicius. Uh, so I, I think Mourinho has the, the pieces there to have a very good season. And yeah, this one, he just kind of has to shake his head. And he more or less did that after the game and said, look, I can't explain what happened. It was just absolutely crazy. If there was ever a moment for that uh, documentary reality TV type of situation <laughs> to continue to be, this was it. I mean, can you imagine after having seen uh, what we saw with the uh, with the behind the scenes documentary? And I know I, I kind of panned it, but I still would have wanted to see what that would have been uh, looked at and, uh, and and talked about and the behind the scenes type of finger pointing and screaming and yelling that may, maybe would have or maybe wouldn't have happened. Uh, all right, what, what did you want to move on to next? You said, well, let me... One, one couple things on that game. Bale did come on, we should say. Yep. Made his uh, yep. debut last 20 minutes. Almost he had a goal. I mean, he should have scored, right? I mean, he did the scored Bale a beautiful thing. Goal, he right cut in. That was it. That was the moment, right? Uh, yeah, but still, I thought that play, he showed some nifty footwork there. That was encouraging to see. That was a sort of trademark. Well, for Bale someone who hasn't played soccer in, in, in months, yes, it's, <laughs> it's good. And then one last thing before we move on. To be fair, all credit to West Ham. Great comeback and all that. I thought the foul on the last goal was ridiculous that they called an Aurier, which precipitated that whole sequence in which uh, Lanzini then connects on the incredible shot. So, I mean, it doesn't take away too much, but still, <laughs> it, to be fair, I thought... So you're putting an a, asterisk on this. Uh, <laughs> it's a this terrible thing. decision. We're going to talk more about And, and you know, later. me bringing up a, a, a very uh, questionable refereeing decision segues nicely to the uh, Everton-Liverpool match at Goodison Park. <laughs> All right, lay it on us. Lay it, lay it on us for those uh, out there that maybe didn't see the, uh, the crazy. No, I mean, so Merseyside Derby ended 2-2. Terrific game. I thought Liverpool were outstanding, played some beautiful football the way they knocked it around um and and outstanding like genuinely or like Klopp after the game interview saying he's really happy they're really ready to play because he started no, to do this thing as where I he... was watching this game okay. I was mesmerized by some of their passing yes. moves agreed, and, agreed. And, this was and... legit good where even the result you can justify a coach saying I'm still proud and happy of the way that we play but yeah this but this game was marked by two uh incidents uh one in each half uh, so we'll take them in the order that they occurred. So in the first half, there's a play where uh, Vir Virgil van Dyke is, is off sides, but he still goes after a loose ball in the box. And so does Jordan Pickford. They collide. Uh, it, you see the replay. It's an awful challenge on Pickford's part. Um, and, and in fact, now the latest is van Dyke is going to be out for the season with a torn ACL yeah. because of it, which, you know, as I mentioned, throw this throws his premier league race wide open again, because I was still of the belief that Liverpool were, clear cut favorites to win it again. But we've talked about this before. He's the one player that they couldn't really afford to lose yep. for a prolonged period. And now he's looks like he's out for the season. So to me, it's up in the air again. I still think Liverpool can win it, but it's, I certainly don't feel that confident about it anymore. Um, but so there's a question about, uh, they, they, they went back and reviewed it because there was a question about whether it was a penalty or not. And then once they determined that Van Dyke was off sides, then that obviously negated whether it was a penalty or not, but there are those that feel like Pickford still should have been sent off with where you can still, even though if you rule it off size, you can still judge that to be a, a, a dangerous challenge and send him off. And it was a little unclear afterwards. There's some conflicting information about whether they reviewed that or not. And so everybody was sort of confused. And then to add insult to injury, Van Dyke is out for the season. So it really shines a light on that, that, that moment even more. Uh, what did you make of that whole scenario? I know that that's, that's got people questioning again, this whole business of, of linesmen, not raising the flag until after the play is over because they feel like players are then continuing to play and at risk of picking up injuries for plays that essentially were already going to be uh, stopped anyway. And so uh, it's, it's become yet another element of this VAR controversy we deal with every week. Well, as far as the AR is continuing and letting things go, if you are going to have VAR, that is a function because you don't want to stop something that then VAR is going to prove actually, uh, or, or that VAR could prove actually should stand. So I, I get that. And does it, does it increase the risk of injury only in as much as continuing to actually play the game does increase the risk of injury as opposed to just standing still? So yes. Um, I, I get that, and these are you know these are these are moments. So that part of it, I I, I have I, I have no problem. Um, you know that this was not punished or dealt with um, is 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 a little bit strange. But I think it goes back to something that there are different rules, and we understand that there are rules and laws out there. Okay, and then there are how the game are is actually refereed, and we all know since the beginning of time 
that what happens in the box is dealt with at times differently than what happens outside the box. And to this to, to this case, what happens when it comes to a ref uh, to a uh, goalkeeper is often dealt with differently. Goalkeepers are given all sorts of leash. Goalkeepers are given all sorts of benefit of the doubt and advantage in in places and in situations where if they happened that involved uh, field players, it never ever would would result in the same thing. Or if it happened outside of the box, it would result in a completely different uh, decision uh, decision being made. Was Pickford actually going for the ball? Not that it not that it matters. I do believe he was. That it was completely poorly timed and in and 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 therefore should have been uh, dealt with. And that he bears the responsibility for his body in, in putting it in a situation like that. I completely agree with. So that one's, you know, that's a, that's a, certainly a head scratcher. And you add insult to what was an injury, but now a really, really bad injury in that he's going to be out and possibly for the rest of the year. And, and like I said, it, it is a huge, huge, uh, huge, huge loss. And it is a head scratcher. I, I can't explain, explain it away other than we have human beings ultimately doing this. Well, and then you have the incident at the end of the game, which look, I, I'm, I'm pro VAR. Uh, so I'll get that out there. I, I do think the game needs some form of VAR. And so you and I have generally, uh, as people have complained about these millimetric offsides decisions, you and I have generally been on the side of defending them. But here's the problem. We, we went through, we had a slew of decisions where if you slow it down and you look carefully enough, you can see, oh yeah, the left shoulder is a smidge ahead. And then there are people that say, oh, it's so close, you should let it go. And then people like you say, well, you can't be a little pregnant. And you, you sort of have that whole conversation. Mm -hmm. But now you're starting to have some plays. And I would put this offsize decision on Mane, which negated a Liverpool stoppage time winner in this category, where he doesn't look offsides at all. It, it's not even a case of being a little pregnant. He doesn't look pregnant at all. I mean, we all are staring at that play. I mean, I think I have pretty good eyesight. And I just don't see where he's offsides at all. So now it's just blind faith. Now you're just accepting the fact that there are a couple of guys sitting in a booth somewhere miles away that have access to this technology that we don't. And they said it's offsides. And so, okay. And then it's offsides and the game has decided that way. And that, that makes me a little uncomfortable when it's something that just not, is not at all verifiable, you know, through the, based on the eye test where, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm staring at that play today. I still, I've seen all different angles of it. I still don't see a play that shows Sadio Mane ahead of the last defender, but they said he was, so I guess so, he was. I, I don't know. I mean, that, that, that makes me a bit uncomfortable. How do you feel about so that? So your uh, discomfort and irritation comes from the fact that people that are um, much better qualified, um, with <laughs> much more experience, okay, uh, are ultimately making a decision that you, with your little brain, can't <laughs> comprehend and and can't qualify and can't prove. Gee, this is an interesting uh, thing that goes well beyond the actual soccer field. At some point, Mossy, all right, you have to take the expert's opinion and believe it to be true, okay? That that you can't see it. All right, first, of, first, first when it comes to clear and obvious, because I know a lot of people throw out clear and obvious. If it takes this long and if, it, if it's this minute and if there's so many different angles that it's really not clear and obvious, no. Ultimately, if it gets to a point where the one frame shows you that it's clear and obvious, then it's clear and obvious using the technology, okay? If it's, it, it, the whole point of the technology is that it's not clear and obvious from our eyesight and we're using the technology to make it clear and obvious. So, so I, 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 I don't buy that. I don't know, you, you, still have no, you still have no issue. I know you've been a staunch VAR defender. And there's nothing you've seen, including the, I play that weekend, that have made you say, yeah, I can kind of see why people are angry. You still find the criticism of it silly, and, and you're still 100% behind what's going on. It, I, if that you can't actually see it, I get that. Completely get that. That's a human reaction. You say, well, why, why, why is it not being proven to me that this is definitive? OK, because obviously it's definitive because these human beings that we will acknowledge have at times much more information, many more angles and much more experience than those of us that are on the uh, on the outside looking in. And that's where the disconnect often comes. It's the transparency and the communication, the understanding. If I was a VAR, if I was involved in refereeing at that level, 
I would want every opportunity to make myself and my brothers and sisters in the, in the referee and VAR world look good in a situation like that as opposed to just having it happen. And then, and look, I'm all for debate and talking and, and the back and forth. That's great content and everything, but it doesn't necessarily have to be so insular and so, um, so difficult for so many people to, under, to, to understand and therefore accept. And, and, and last thing on this game, unrelated to any VAR business, uh, James Rodriguez, even in what was ostensibly a, a quiet game for him because Liverpool had more of the ball and were on the front foot, he still had a few moments. I mean, there was a play early in the second half where he was on the right side and he pinged this cross field ball to Lucas Digne where he just dropped it perfectly through all these Liverpool defenders. And I found myself thinking there's like five players in the world that could make that pass. And, and so, yeah, I mean, he, he is just a joy to watch right now. And yeah, even though I think Liverpool played great and were the better team and should have won, you still saw – uh, signs of what's made Everton a better team this season. Uh, so I, I think there are some good things happening there. I don't think they were found out uh, this weekend. I, I, I think they are legit, not in terms of winning the title, but perhaps in terms of cracking that top six. All right, Masi, uh, let's, that, let's, uh, let's move out of uh, England because there was other stuff that happened. Uh, and I know we're going a little bit long here, but, uh, but it, was, it, it was fun. Should we go to uh, Italy real quick? Sure. All right. So Milan Derby, um, Inter, versus Milan Zlatan going to Zlatan uh you know he uh, he was out with corona for a while it has not slowed him down the man just scores goals he scored both of them for uh for Milan in their two to one win uh over Inter he was uh perfect no but he was a machine which he has always uh been especially when it comes uh to goal scoring should are you are we ever now surprised at what Zlatan does? No, uh, but you know, I mean, this, this was really a terrific performance, not just the goals, but his hold-up play. He was an outlet. Anytime Milan uh, were in trouble, they knew they could uh, kick a ball up there and he would, he would win a header or come down with it. Uh, even he's lasted all 90 minutes, even in the closing minutes when they were protecting that lead, he was working hard. He, he even intercepted a pass in the closing moments. Uh, so yeah, terrific all around performance for him and, and, and terrific result for AC Milan, who, you know, they, they made that interesting decision to back off the Ralph Rangnick thing and stick with, uh, Pioli. And, and, and so far it's been vindicated. They're off to a great start, four wins out of four. They, they sit atop the Serie A standings. I don't think they can win the title, but I definitely think they have a shot at top four. So AC Milan, who are much the same way we talk about Manchester United in England. They're, they're a, this giant that's been dormant for a lot of years, and they might be turning a bit of a corner here on the way back. They have some, some really good young players. This Ben Asset in the midfield I really like. Uh, they also have Tonali and Brahim Diaz, who right, right now he, he's breaking them in slowly, Pioli is. Uh, but so a lot of talent there. I thought Rafael Leon had a good game. And, and then obviously Zlat, a terrific goalkeeper in Donnarumma. And then Zlatan is obviously the, the leader there for all those young guys. And they sort of, uh, they, they feed off him. And so, uh, yeah, a lot of good things happening for, for AC Milan right now. That was, a, that was a very good result for them to beat Inter in the Derby. All right, let's just finish up uh, the uh, Serie A. And I know we're giving it a, a little bit of a, of a short shift here, but um, uh, Juventus, 2-2-0 two, two and oh to start this Serie A season. Is this the year, Masi? Is, is, is this the year? Is there an opening? Is there a possibility? Or uh, have we been down this road before and we got to be careful? Well, to be fair, they, they drew uh, newly promoted Crotoni 1-1 uh, this past week and no Cristiano Ronaldo because uh, of the uh, coronavirus and also no Weston McKinney for the right. same reason. Um, so, But the interesting thing there is he left Dybala out again and, and Pirlo is not not playing Dybala at all this season and Dybala finally erupted. Uh, there were reports of, uh, of uh, in the tunnel, he got into it with a, a Juventus director and complaining about the situation and what's going on, why aren't I playing? So that's something Pirlo's got to get sorted out there because the ball is way too good. I mean, I can't believe, especially on a day we don't have Cristiano Ronaldo available. He's your other great match winner there. You'd think you want to get him on the field. So, uh, so yeah, you know, Pirlo, a young coach, there's some things there for him to sort out. The only thing is the team we all thought was going to uh, potentially topple Juve this season is Inter. And as I just mentioned, they just lost the Derby and haven't gotten off to the greatest start to the season either. So we'll see. Uh, my, you know, my money's probably still on Juventus, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's definitely some things to sort out there. And obviously we wish a uh, speedy recovery for both Cristiano Ronaldo and Weston McKinney. Yep. Uh, over in Spain, uh, Sergio Dest, uh, Sergino, Sergio, Sergio Dest, uh, the American making history. 
Uh, starting for Barcelona, congratulations to him, uh, although it comes in a loss. And if you if you pulled up the standings of La Liga uh, today, <laughs> you will think you were you, you would think you were in an alternate reality and universe right now because nowhere will you find Barcelona or Real Madrid when it comes to the top of the league. What is going on here in La Liga, Masi? Yeah, I mean, uh, so Barcelona lose one in the way to Getafe. Sergio, that's, by the way, one of the few bright spots. Uh, the, the newspaper Sport gave him gave him high marks in their player ratings. Uh, he, he, he started again at left back, um, which they keep saying, oh, he's keep in mind, folks, he's playing out of position and he's still yeah. looking good. Imagine when he actually well, gets we know that about him because we've watched him with the national team. <laughs> uh, and he, he almost had an, a, an assist. He had a pass to Messi, which Messi uh, smacked off the off the post. Um, so so. Good start to life for Des, but terrible result for Barcelona, who ha- had gotten off to a good start this season, had nice wins over Villarreal and Celta Vigo. There was some buzz that maybe Ronald Koeman had kind of sorted out all their problems. And then they were brought back down to earth a little bit with that 1-1 draw against Sevilla, and now they lose this game. So now it's, it's back to <laughs> everybody thinking Barcelona are a mess. The, but at least Real Madrid lost two. Real Madrid lose 1-0 at home to Cadiz. And again, the story there is... I keep saying this, there's just not enough goals in that Real Madrid lineup. If it's not a moment of magic from Benzema, you wonder where, where are the goals going to come from? Hazard is injured and nobody even expects much from him anymore. Um, you know, Vinicius is exciting and all that, but just, just can't, can't find the back of the net. And so you end up every game, they seem to be walking this tightrope, nil-nil, one-nil, and just hoping for that one moment. And, and then this time the ball bounced the other way. And so they lose one-nil instead of, you know, this was like a lot of other games I've seen where they won one-nil. And so when they win, it kind of gets swept under the rug. But it's a real problem. I mean, I, I think La Liga is more competitive than people give it credit for. But there's still enough riffraff there that if you're around Madrid, you should be getting some four-nils, you know, every now and then. And they never do. It's always this, this, uh, these tight games. And, and so, you know, it's a problem. All right. Well, congratulations to Real Sociedad sitting at the top of the uh, standings, and 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 for that matter, Cadiz uh, sitting there at uh, in in fifth place. We should hey, just stop uh, it right now, huh? David Silva, uh, <laughs> he's uh, having a good impact there. All right, let's finish it up real quick uh, over in the uh, in the Bundesliga. Uh, we uh, the return of Tyler Adams, uh, which is good news from a U.S. perspective, and just the continued. Uh, I'm going to say, I mean, dominance, I guess it would be certainly in terms of playing and starting when it comes to uh, G arena. I mean, he's, he's, it's not even a question anymore right now. Honestly, he's a starter. No, absolutely. The interesting thing with this game, Dortmund had a nice win one nil away to Hoffenheim. And so Lucien Favre left Holland on the bench to start because presumably because of his international uh, excursions and, exertions I, I just i had an exacerbated exacerbated yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> and i got called up uh, for my... <laughs> presumably because of his uh, international exertions um and so as that game is zero zero you're thinking okay there dortmund's going to start making some substitutions here bring on some attacking players probably royce and holland are going to come on and you wonder for who because he, he had at the start of the game he had sancho reyna and brant as the the front three and so uh, he brought on in the 64th minute, he made, made a double sub, brought on Holland and Royce, and Royce came on for Sancho and not Reyna. And, and, and Reyna was having a better game than Sancho. Sancho, by the way, has had a bit of an indifferent start to the season, but, but still, that spoke volumes to me of how much Reyna, it's not even just, just that he's starting, but now he's sort of a guy that Lucien Favre trusts to keep in there uh, in a game like that, and he ends up playing the full 90 minutes and playing a part in, in the goal by Royce. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, v- very encouraging. I mean, Reyna is really establishing himself as like a pillar of that team. It's, it's, it's so much so that the inexperience relative to pretty much everybody else, and obviously the youth, is, is secondary in the way that we're framing his role and the responsibility and the analysis of what's going on. It's, it's almost an afterthought. Oh, and by the way, you know, who we're talking about doing this or needs to do this or uh, is being counted on and is the focus and the focal point for this. Oh, by the way, <laughs> he's a teenager and uh, he's only in his how many, you know, he's had a handful of games when it comes to actually uh, playing. Uh, the, the evolution and the speed of the evolution is, is dramatic and quite impressive. Um, and I hope it just continues on. Uh, anything else from over there in Europe, Mossy, that you want to mention? Uh, last, last thing, Bayern one four one. But so I'm going to keep an eye on uh, Lucas Hernandez. Has started the last couple of games at left back, not Alfonso Davies, which 
uh, Bavarian Football Works, which is a website I, I check out a lot on Bayern, they, they wrote something on it and Hansi Flick was asked about it. And Hansi gave an interesting answer. He said, you know, uh, right now, Lucas Hernandez is offering a little bit more of what we need at that position. He said, Davies is a young player who played a lot of games and had a short preseason, and he's not physically and mentally exactly where we want him to be right now, which was a bit of a weird quote. I mean, Alfonso Davies, I thought, had more than established himself <laughs> there. And, and so uh, I don't think it's too much to worry about. I mean, I think he'll eventually be, be starting regularly at left back, but uh, I don't know. I do, too. I, yeah, I, I do too. I think he's he's that good. But there is a um, a bubble, if you will, uh, this, this rarefied air that a young and once again, an experienced type of player can get into. And you know, I remember when I was just starting out with the, with the national team, John Harks looked at me one day and said, if, if half of your years as a pro are successful, then consider yourself having a successful career. Um, and look, this isn't, you know, the, the start of the demise of uh, Alfonso Davies or anything like that, but things can change very, very quickly uh, in our, in our sport. And the, the lofty, and like I said, that rarefied air that you live in, it can get really thin very, very quickly. Uh, or be sucked out of whatever room or bubble that you are in very, very quickly. And it can, be, it can happen in a matter of a game, Wally Pip type of situation, uh, or just a new surroundings or a new setting or a resetting of, uh, of circumstances. And especially when you're playing in a team like Bayern Munich that can kind of afford to make those changes and not suffer. Um, we'll see when it really gets down to it, when there is a game that has to be won, uh, and a game where you're playing equal or maybe at times, very rare times, but at times a better opponent if Alfonso Davies is ultimately selected as that, uh, as that left back for uh, going forward. And, and keep in mind, once again, uh, you mentioned uh, Dest playing on the left-hand side. Alfonso Davies, that's, that was not his position. He has made it his position. And so in a sense, as great as it was, He's still learning as we're, as we're going along. I think he would probably be the first person to tell you. All right, anything else uh, from a uh, European roundup, Mossy? That's it. All right, we're going to take a real quick break here. And when we come back, a full MLS roundup, all sorts of stuff happening uh, domestically uh, here on and off the field when it comes uh, to Major League Soccer. Um, so don't go away. Uh, just a couple minutes here. We'll be right back. Moving on. All right, we're back. Uh, we're going to look into what's going on MLS wise, and there, you know, obviously the the games and the goals uh, are wonderful, but there's also stuff that is happening uh, off the field and bigger picture type of stuff that's going on right now. And we've, you know, we've talked about this ever since 2020 became the 2020 that we now know it, and obviously with the pandemic and the shutdown and the complete change of the way we do business, we've talked about how we should judge players, teams, leagues, sports in the unprecedented times that are 2020. Uh, we come to find out this, uh, this week uh, and this weekend that the Supporters' Shield, and for those that don't know, the Supporters' Shield is the annual award given out to the MLS team that is the best in the regular season, not MLS Cup, in the regular season. Um, and we know that MLS is a league that has their regular season, and then whatever you do in the regular season uh, contributes to whether you move on and play in the postseason. But from a regular, team, uh, regular season perspective, the Supporters' Shield is awarded. Uh, it is... Uh, awarded by the supporters, thus the name. And um, it is obviously an honor for what you have done during the season. And that it comes from the supporters means uh, that much more. The Supporters Shield Foundation, which is the, the group, you can find it online, um, and the, the affiliation of all the different supporters from all the different teams, announced this, uh, this week that they will not be awarding in 2020 the Supporters Shield to that best team in the regular season. A lot of different uh, reactions to this uh, out there. Uh, first and foremost, from, from my perspective, I have no problem with this decision, uh, if that's what they feel is appropriate. And the reasons that they gave, that they gave and I think are, are important. Um, 
talking about the inability for supporters to be in attendance and fill the stadiums with their passion. Um, and obviously the completely uh, lack of competitive balance uh, when it comes to the way that the season is set up. Now, the first argument is, well, when it comes to the unbalanced uh, and season, that's always been the case for MLS. And you would absolutely be right. But let's be honest, folks. All right. It's apples and oranges when it comes to comparing 2020 with anything uh, from the past. OK, the it, it, as I've said many times, it is unprecedented in terms of what the teams have been asked to go through and how completely different the situation and the circumstances and the scenarios are in 2020 relative uh, to previous years. So yes, there is a lack of balance when it comes to even last year or, the, or 10 years ago, but it's nothing, nothing compared to the difficulty of ultimately judging and therefore awarding a shield to somebody for what they do in the, in the, uh, in the regular season. Now, the argument is there that you know what? The supporter shield is just a supporter shield, regardless of what the circumstances are. You either win it or you don't. But let's be honest. We talk about the supporter shield and we talk about how many supporter shields have you won. Oh, they're last year's supporter shield winners. And we attach and we ascribe a value to that relative to what has happened in the past. And to do that this year, okay, it would be, I think, an unfair comparison. OK, if you are the supporter shield winner in 2020, it is a very, very different type of proposition and pathway that you have taken than any time uh, in the past. So that, that that's that's that, that's my take. If they don't want to award it, that's fine. There's also the take that you do award. it. There's a take that you award it with an asterisk. I don't believe that you reward if either you award it or you don't. And if you reward it, you don't do an, uh, an, an asterisk. Uh, you just, you, you say, this is what it is, uh, and you move on. Now, there's a couple of other conversations that are going on right now. We're not going to get too much into the weeds. Right now, there's fighting and infighting going on because many of the supporters didn't feel that they were included in the conversation and ultimately in the decision. There is fighting from uh, players. Uh, you can look at the uh, way Alejandro Bedoya has reacted and he's not happy about this decision. You can look at the coach of Toronto FC, Greg Vanny. He's not happy about this, uh, this decision. Uh, I will say when it comes to, to Greg Vanny, he's a, he's a smart man and I I, the, that he's angry, I get it. His team is doing very well and they were certainly in line to win this. I think a lot of it stems from the fact that he feels that he and his, more importantly, his team are not going to be given the credit and be given the praise that he feels they are due. And in no way should, should my uh, support of this decision of not awarding the uh, supporter shield mean that I devalue or don't value what is being done this year. As a matter of fact, when it comes to what MLS teams have had to go through and what the players and the coaches uh, have had to go through in 2020, as I said, it's never been done before. And in particular, the Canadian teams, Greg Vanny's Toronto FC being one of them, what they have had to do, hats off. Absolutely, they deserve praise and they deserve um, you know, all of the accolades uh, and thanks um, and credit and value that I can give. But when it comes to the actual supporters shield, that's not necessarily something that I think needs to be given at this point. Maybe they make something else and they give something else uh, for it. We, we saw it earlier with the MLS's back trophy that was, uh, that was awarded. So that's, that's how I'm, that's how I'm reacting uh, to, some, uh, to something like this. But it is interesting to see how the players are reacting, how the coach is reacting. This story might not be over. There might be a, a change of heart when it comes to the supporter shield, uh, given some of the real uh, criticisms uh, and, like I said, anger out there uh, from players, coaches, and, uh, and teams out there, and fans. And by the way, as it, as, it replaced, as, it, as it applies to the fans, okay, this is a year unlike any other year in that we have not had fans, supporters in the stands. Does that mean they haven't supported? No. As a matter of fact, they've gone out of their way to support in what is a trying year. They have virtually supported. They have showed it up at training uh, camps. They've showed up at, outside the stadiums. They showed up at airports. Uh, they have done everything in their power to show that they are still there supporting. But let's be honest. The heart of the supporters culture when it comes to Major League Soccer 
is that game day experience. It is what is celebrated. It is what is sold, not just by Major League Soccer, but by the supporters groups themselves. Okay. And I know that there's much more to being a supporter than just that 90 minutes. And it's your involvement with your community. It's the way that you dress, the way that you walk, the way that you act in that other 22 and a half hours of the day and the rest of the week when there isn't a game. But that game day experience and whether it's the moment that you get there and the tailgating and the parties or the march to the match uh, or the singing in the, in the game, that is the lifeblood. That is that heart beating into the rest of uh, the week and the rest of the body, if you, if, if you will. And to not have that, okay, I think that in and of itself is one of the reasons not to, uh, to award uh, uh, the support or why I'm okay with not awarding it. Look, I don't award it. You award it or don't award it. It's up, it's up to you. But why I understand this decision. Mossy, I know I, I, I spewed out a lot of words there, but any reaction? No, I was okay with this decision too, for the reasons you mentioned. This is just such a wonky regular season that for me, it crossed a threshold. And by the way, we still might end up with teams not playing the same, same amount of games and having to go to points per game to determine the standing. So um, I, I'm fine with not awarding a supporter shield this year. I'm surprised at, at how angry the reaction is, but I think it speaks to this larger issue that I've, I've talked about on this podcast before. MLS wants to have its cake and eat it too. And to me, you either have to... Uh, satisfy the purists and, and build a league where everybody plays everybody and whoever has the most points at the end is your champion, which I know in the case of MLS, you would have to start from scratch again and scrap the whole concept of divisions and, and conferences and, and unbalanced schedule. And so it, it would be quite the undertaking. So I'm not saying they should do it. At this point, they've kind of gone down one path. They should stick with it. But either you're that type of league or you're a playoff league and then you just own it that you're a playoff league and the regular season is only relevant in the context of positioning yourself for the playoffs and seating and home field advantage, et cetera. Instead, they've to kind of appease the purists and like I said, try to have their cake and eat it too. They've created this trophy, the supporter shield for the team with the best regular season record. And they've created so much fanfare around it that now you actually have people running around and saying, uh, I'd rather my team win the supporter shield or to me, there's more value in winning a supporter shield than MLS cup which is crazy. I can't think of another sports league where you crown a champion at the end of the, the season, but you give out another trophy along the way where fans are actually saying, I'd rather my team win that than to win the, the championship of the league that season. But it's now created this dynamic where taking away the supporter shield feels like you're really delegitimizing the season in a way that I think it shouldn't. I think we should all just not care about the supporter shield that much and just understand that in a league where you have a playoff culminating with MLS Cup at the end, that's all that ultimately really matters. But but the cat the cat's out of the bag there. I mean, the supporter shield has grown to this level of importance where, as you mentioned, players are coming out, they're furious and Greg Vanny and and they feel like the, the, something that's really core to an MLS season is being taken away from them in a way that, that frankly surprised me, but that's how they feel. So what I hear is David Mossy doesn't like supporters, okay? Because this is this is from the supporters. This is of the supporters. This is this is a a way of of showing how important and how vital the supporters are. In that it was created, it is administered, uh, and it is awarded by the supporters each and every year. And which is why they get to make the decision ultimately on this. And there's a lot of infighting, like I said, that's uh, that's going on right now. And uh, look. For those of you that have been around American soccer, you know that nobody fights amongst ourselves better than uh, U.S. soccer. We eat our own and we are often our worst enemy when it comes to the things that we do. It, it does come from a good place a lot of times, not always. It does come from a good place in that we are passionate about it and we take ownership of, uh, of these types of things. But look, I don't know how this is ultimately uh, going to be decided. But first off, everything that we do this year is going to have our own personal asterisk. Every single time we talk about something that happened in 2020, it's going to be, oh yeah, that was 2020. And you just say 2020, people are going to associate it with the pandemic and therefore a, as you said, a very warped and different type of version of normal when it comes to what we have been used to uh, in the past. Now, so, so understand that that's, that's going to happen no matter, uh, no matter what we do. I, I don't know how this is ultimately uh, going, to, uh, going to get resolved, but whoever is the, whoever has by points, whatever it's total points or it's points per game, whatever it ends up being, whoever that team is, whatever we are calling that team, just know, okay, 
that it bears little to no resemblance of any other team in the past that has won the same award or done the same thing in order to win that award. If it's the exact, if it's the exact same award or if it's called the same, the same thing, or if it ends up being called something, uh, something different. And that's not, that's not to, to denigrate or to downplay or to devalue what you have done. It's just, it's just the reality and the fact of what 2020 and the sandwich that 2020 is has given us. Ah, oh, mossy. All right. Anyway, uh, I don't know how they get it sorted out. Uh, we'll see. Uh, the the continued, um, and this is this is once again maybe a result of 2020, when we talk about the young players that are being given opportunities, and I'm talking about your you know your your Caden Clark's over at uh, Red Bulls, you know, 17 years old. Uh, your Cade Cowles of, over at, at San Jose, 17 years old. Your uh, you know, Christian Torres, who we saw last night for, from a uh, developmental standpoint, homegrown for LAFC. The list goes on and on and on. Now, that's the good news, is that we are seeing a, a crop of domestically developed players, and most of them uh, that are able to play with the U.S. men's national team, that qualify for playing for the U.S. men's national team. Not all of them, but, but most of them. Uh, th this is this is great news. This is great news for development. This is great news for American and Canadian soccer. But there's a part of me that is saddened by this because a part of me feels that the reason why we are seeing this is because of 2020. And it took 2020 to realize uh, and to graphically uh, realize the talent that exists. Because I'm not sure, Mossy, if this is 2019 um, or if this is normal times that we are seeing this type of, I guess, it, courage, experimentation, whatever you want to call it, teams willing to throw out these young players because it's 2020 and the ramifications and the risks um, and the repercussion, repercussions of doing something like this in 2020 are very different than maybe uh, doing it in the past. And, and it saddens me because it took this for people to realize what, what we've been screaming about all along. And even worse is when we do go back to whatever normal is uh, and back to much more of a semblance of what has happened in the past, does it revert? I mean, that's the, that's a good, bad type of news situation that's going on right now. And for now, I'll take the good news because it's wonderful. Uh, you know, we've talked about Brendan Aronson and the what's rumored to be six million dollar transfer for the uh, young Philadelphia uh, Union uh, homegrown player uh, over to um, Salzburg, uh, Red Bull Salzburg. And that's that's great. By the way, uh, if they really got that much money. Good for them. I didn't think it was going to be that much money. Good for them. And they probably are sharing in a future uh, sale going on. So good for uh, Philadelphia. Congratulations. Congratulations to MLS and congratulations to uh, Brendan Aronson for that pathway. And we'll see uh, what goes on. Although a, 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 a real quick comment that MLS and the Philadelphia Union in their press release didn't have the numbers in there. I think it's a wasted opportunity. Now they ended up leaking it to, to others, but you know, own that, stand on that. That that shows that you are not only developing good talent, but that you are in the market that the world operates in, the soccer world operates uh, operates in. And be proud, trumpet that. All right, that's that's a good number, and you're not doing anybody harm. You're actually pumping yourself up and making yourself good because of that number that exists right right there. Mossy, uh, are, are you as excited as I am about? And I'm usually not that excited about young players, but I do extrapolate it out and I look to what's happening with the national team and or what could be happening with the national team. But are you as excited about it and or are you concerned about it when it comes to the reality of why this may be happening? No, I'm excited about it. I, I agree with you. I think 2020 has something to do with it, but I, I think it's something that'll stick. It seems to be the general direction the league is moving in. Uh, there are reports that, by the way, that Barcelona are tracking Kate Cowell, uh, 
17 year old from San Jose. Um, and you mentioned Brendan Aronson. They, they supposedly had their eyes on him too, but he ends up moving to Salzburg instead, which, which I think is a very smart move on his part. And uh, Andrew Wiebe, uh, MLS.com, I, I thought wrote a pretty good piece trying to argue that MLS can sort of have its cake and eat it too, that uh, you can sell some of your top young players hold on to others. And then with the money you're making from selling some of your young players, if you buy the right guys, you could sort of be this quote unquote selling league, but also a league of choice and also a league that has a lot of quality as one of the best in the world. And so he thinks that there is an ability for MLS clubs to kind of thread that needle if they do it smartly. Uh, so uh, yeah, that, I mean, it's a really good piece on his part. I think it's going to be interesting to see over the next few years if MLS clubs are able to do that. Well, we've talked about that that balance and that difficulty of of maintaining that balance and not becoming that farm league and, and and lower league or feeder league, if you will, but still participating in the the churn of uh, of the market that exists out there and the buying and the selling uh, of players. And, and I don't know; it's a it's a it's a very difficult dance for MLS to do. And money solves a lot of those things. And we've talked about <laughs> spending other people's uh, uh, other people's money when it comes. Uh, when it comes to MLS. All right. Those are, you know, those are some good things that are happening and you know, the, the continued, uh, the, the continued results out there, the Los Angeles galaxy who were in a free fall, uh, finally find a way out of it. albeit <laughs> with a 90 minute, uh, winner to finish, um, uh, with a, a win. Finally, this, you know, this may have, who knows it's 2020 again, but who knows this may have saved, Guillermo Barrasquiloto's job, at least for the, the moment uh, when it comes to the, uh, the head coach and maybe others in, uh, at, at the Galaxy. And let's be honest, they only beat Vancouver, okay? But, but it's still a win. So congratulations to them. Chicharito did not start. As a matter of fact, he was, uh, he was subbed in. And even when he was on the field, he missed, um, uh, he, he, you know, he missed chances and still just does not look the part uh, at all. We mentioned LAFC uh, throwing out a 16-year-old uh, and getting a uh, result up in Portland, 1-1 up there. Lots of ties, Minnesota, Houston, 2-2. Two, two. Uh, Toronto FC, which continues to play, as I said, in this adopted home up there in Connecticut at Rensselaer, uh, finds a way past Atlanta. It's, it's still Atlanta. And I guess congratulations are in order to DC United, the first win in the DC United era as they continue to search uh, for a coach after the 10 year uh, tenure of uh, uh, of Ben Olson as they go into Cincinnati and get a two uh, uh, a two nothing win. Columbus finally uh, back on on course. Remember they started out so hot uh, and they continue to be there. You know the the question of who is the best team, you know you mentioned the supporter shield. okay, from a numbers perspective, fine, but who is the best team right now? in major league soccer. I mean, I think you could have a long, long debate as to, as to who it is. Obviously Toronto is going to scream and yell Philadelphia certainly has a case Columbus now back uh, in the mix, if you will, Orlando has just kind of been consistent, but I'm not sure there's a lot of people out there that would say that that is the best team in major league soccer other than Orlando people. And by the way, Orlando people, just, just, just a second here. Um, you, you can scream and yell all you, you want. And as I said before, you, you don't get the benefit of the doubt, okay? Uh, you're Orlando. You have not even made the playoffs in your entire existence. And until you do, okay, you really haven't done anything. Doesn't mean I'm not excited. Doesn't mean I'm not happy for what you have done this year. And that there is a competitive and appealing Orlando team in Major League Soccer. Wow, well done. I'm, I'm excited about that. I truly am. I, I, that's something that we have wanted for years. And now that we finally have it, you want me to pat you on the back and tell, me, tell you how great you are? No, oh, got to earn it. Got to earn it. Uh, and you've been earning it so far, though. Uh, so you're headed certainly in the right direction. And I'll, I will look forward to see what happens uh, when you get to the playoffs because you, you're, you're definitely going to make Well, if you don't make the playoffs, then something really, really bad has gone wrong. Seattle just continues to, uh, uh, to, cruise, uh, to cruise along. LAFC, which hasn't had a great year, still finds itself in the top four out there in the West. And the Galaxy, even with the win, sitting, uh, sitting at the bottom. And, you know, I, I, people ask me all the time, you know, should they make a, should they, should, should they fire the coach? Should they fire the GM? Should they fire the president? Uh, whether it's Guillermo Barsciloto, uh, Chris Klein, uh, um, or uh, Dennis Teclosa. Look, 
you know, in our business, we talk about people getting sacked, people getting fired, but, but sometimes it's, uh, it's sport. And I get it. That's, that's part of sports, but um, you know, these are ultimately human beings that potentially could be losing the jobs with families uh, and all that. And so calling for people to get fired, you know, yeah, there's times where a change is needed. Okay. And when you look at the, the Los Angeles galaxy uh, right now, I know there's a lot of people that are calling for change, either massive change, everybody out or uh, coach out or anybody, uh, anybody in between. I'm not sure once again, if there's an impetus, if there is a real desire right now, as opposed to the end of the year of making a change. I mean, the way things are going right now, you know, yeah, you certainly could make the playoffs, but um, maybe they just recognize that we're just going to let this, this year play out. And once again, I told you, if you're going to fail, if you're going to be bad, if you're going to do things that are going to generate criticism, do it in 2020, because you will be forgiven. Not everything, but you will be forgiven a lot and a whole lot more in 2020 than in 2019. And in a certain way, hopefully, you will be given a, you will, you will be forgiven a whole lot less in 2021 because hopefully we return to some sort of uh, normalcy. All right, anything else, uh, MLS Mossy? That's it. All right, we're going to take uh, another quick break here. And when we come back, oh, yeah, it's time for Ask Alexi. Uh, and we read some of your comments, questions, and concerns. We'll be right back. Moving on. Okay, we're back. It's time for Ask Alexi. Use a hashtag Ask Alexi and then uh, send us some comments, questions, and concerns. And uh, we will pick a few. Mossy, what do the folks want to know about this week? First up, this comes from at Fox Soccer. So this, this might Ooh, really? Like the mothership. Okay. Alex Dowd or Luis Aguilar asking this question for all we know. Uh, with the old firm Merseyside and Milan Derbies this weekend, it got us thinking, what is the best rivalry in the world? Hmm. Interesting. Um, did you just say Darby? I did, yes. Look, as a studier of language and linguistics and, and, uh, and such, what is your justification for saying Darby? I don't view Darby as like a schedule where it's the same word just pronounced differently. I view it closer to like pitch and field in which they've just created their own expression that doesn't really apply. I've never heard anybody refer to the Michigan Ohio state Darby or the Red Sox Yankees Darby. I think essentially rivalry is sort of our equivalent of Darby. So when I say it, I say it the English way, because that to me is the only way that it really exists. Does that make any sense? No, it makes no sense at all. It's Derby. (laughs) All right. You're just, you're just, I mean, you're so self self absorbed and snobby. You you can't. I don't I want mean, to start any controversy over this. Like, <laughs> look at your schedule. You know, you're not in a gantry now. You're at your home. It's just- Derby, okay? <laughs> it is Derby. All right. For me, it's Derby. For you, it's Derby. I, I'll tell you how pompous I am. I refer to the horse race as the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! All right. Well, anyway. Um, so, so they want to know about great ones out there. Well, I'm on record. And, and for those that, that haven't listened in the past, I'm on record when it comes to international derbies. All right. Great <laughs> rivalry games. There is no better. And I know I'm biased when it comes to us, Mexico. All right. The history, the connections, the social and political and obviously competitive sporting connections that we have had and the long line of games, the, uh, the level of competition, the super status that we have within our region as those superpowers, um, when it comes to CONCACAF, all of that thing combined, uh, you know, the, um, the mythology, whether it's, uh, uh, down in Azteca or in Columbus or, or anything else, all of that combined for me makes that one of the great Darbies in the world uh, and rivalries uh, in the world from an international perspective, you know, then you, then you have your usual suspects. You know, we talked about the, uh, the Milan Derby uh, earlier, earlier in the show, Uh, the classic car, which we've covered over the years, which is, which is always, which is always fun because of the history, because of the, once again, the competition, the animosity between the two, the two groups and, you know, the, the bragging rights and you mentioned old firm and all of these things. And, you know, it's interesting that 
some of these things are Clasico, Barcelona, Real Madrid. You know, some of these things take on uh, additional meaning and importance that supersedes anything that's going on. Um, and the, the results and the standings and all that stuff, it, 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 wouldn't, it doesn't even matter. And I know for a fact that, that you talk about players and teams, there are certain players, teams, and fan bases and supporters out there that in the course of events that happen over a season, they can forgive Champions League or they can forgive losing the title, but they can't forgive losing to your main rival. And that's what ultimately I think derbies are all about. Mossy, what comes, what comes to mind when you start thinking about these things? Well, I'm going to use this uh, question as a jumping off point to uh, talk about two different rivalries that I think are uh, going in opposite directions right now. First off, just to answer the question, I think Barcelona-Real Madrid is the biggest rivalry uh, in this sport. That being said, they played this upcoming weekend. Barcelona hosts Real Madrid. And I would venture to say this is the least eagerly anticipated Clásico in my lifetime. Now, partly because it's going to be in an empty stadium, and, and, and so that's going to take away a lot of the atmosphere. Plus, it's uh, so early in the season that we're still kind of getting our bearings here. But that, all that is just part of it. I think also part of it is that these teams are just not that great anymore. This, this fixture used to be like the pinnacle of European football. And now it feels like just another good game next weekend. It feels like you're sitting down to watch like the seventh best team in Europe against the ninth best team. I'm at, I haven't done my power rankings, but you know what I mean? It's not like you're sitting down to watch like the elite of the elite in this sport anymore. Uh, obviously, you, you still have Messi. You don't have Ronaldo anymore. So that's part of it. But uh, I don't know. That It's just flat to me like i'm not are you like super excited next weekend for barcelona around madrid in an empty stadium like that's not really getting my juices going like it used to you're dis i think you're disrespecting and disregarding the 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 point of the of the derby i mean the the entire point is that it has nothing to do with the players the, the individual players it has nothing to do with the standings it has to do with with the history now that the that the environments which would which do have to do a, a big part with why they are so important aren't there i think that a part of your argument is is completely fair and valid but but that the teams may not be at their pinnacle that the teams may not have the superstars of the past does it take something away i i guess but that's not the way that i look i mean you know i mentioned us mexico you know, the fact that Landon Donovan's not playing doesn't take anything away from it uh, for me. Um, and, and maybe it's a little different from an international perspective uh, because there's a constant changing of the guard that, that, that goes on. But I don't, I don't think it loses, I mean, look, from a, a pure rating standpoint, sure, it's going to lose eyeballs, but I don't think it loses significance simply because either the teams aren't what they once were or the, or the personnel on the field isn't what they once were. Well, and then uh, a rivalry that I think is really gaining steam again is the old firm, which uh, this past weekend, Rangers won uh, two nil away to Celtic. They've actually won uh, in their last two visits to Celtic Park. Uh, and boy, you cannot say enough about what a job Steven Gerrard do- has done there. You know, I, I've joked on this podcast before. I wasn't sure which rivalry was going to come back sooner, Michigan, Ohio State or Celtic Rangers. And you have to say it's Celtic Rangers. Steven Gerrard has achieved what Jim Harbaugh has not been able to. Uh, but so, I mean, just give an idea. The last two old firms before Gerrard took charge of Rangers, Celtic won 4-0 and 5-0. And the season before that, there were two 5-1 Celtic victories. So even when Rangers were able to get promoted again, the, these two clubs were not competing in the same weight class. And then he came along in the summer of 2018, and he's made it a rivalry again in his eight games against Celtic. He's won four of them. And, you know, we'll see if uh, they – their so Rangers are in first place right now, four points clear of Celtic. They have played one more game. But uh, it's interesting. Um, 442 Magazine did a terrific article recently looking back on the 97-98 Scottish Premiership campaign in which Rangers were going for their 10th straight title. And this Celtic uh, side led by Craig Burley, among others, and probably stopped the streak and won the title that season. Now it's Celtic going for 10 in a row and Rangers trying to stop them. And early on this season, people are getting a sense that it it might happen. So and, and, you know, as far as Gerrard, I mean, you talk about when you're a great player. Uh, the coaching and front office door is open for you, even when you don't even deserve it. But in this case, he's actually showing himself to also be a terrific manager. So I think he's, he's a real rising star here in the coaching ranks doing doesn't a matter. terrific job. And doesn't and matter. It, Ill-gotten gains. They don't count. What do you if mean? he was just handed an opportunity, 
<laughs> All right. And he bypassed and skipped the line uh, over everybody else. And why I mean, are you already, extolling? I'm already thinking, you know, if you're telling me Jurgen Klopp, maybe two or three more years at Liverpool, if, and then Gerard maybe stays two or three more years at Rangers, maybe wins a league title. And then when Klopp is ready to leave, Gerard steps in. I could see do, it. Now, do you think it's it's Gerard? And look, I, I, I don't watch it, so uh, I don't know. Maybe you have a better idea. Or maybe some of our, uh, of our loyal listeners have a better idea. Is it I know he's going to get the credit because it happens under his watch would, and I don't know who the previous coach was there. Would the previous coach go? Yeah, but look what he has at his disposal that I didn't have. Is he getting more out of the same players or is this a whole new team? And therefore he's able to coach a, a much better quality of player and more talent around him. No, I mean, my understanding I mean, I'm not taking away from, he may be the greatest coach out there. I don't know. My understanding is he hasn't spent all that much money. Uh, so it's not like he's working with like an abundance of talent there and he's getting more out of players and previous managers did. And also that he's, he is doing some very good things tactically, particularly defensively. They have a great defensive record this season and he's gotten a lot of credit for that. So no, I think, he, I think, I think it's him and uh, he deserves a lot of credit and it's great to have that rivalry back. Uh, you he know, that's one where you really miss the fans. I mean, that, that would have been great. <laughs> that's to have true. Celtic that's Rangers true. But I can't believe you're but, giving him credit for something that he was, uh, that he was given um, that he didn't know, deserve. So uh, anyway. our, our good friend and Fox sports colleague, Moe do who played for uh, Rangers scored in an old firm uh, Derby. You know, we, we I'll ask, I'll ask his take on it next time I talk to him. Cause he, he does follow Rangers still uh, perhaps we'll even get him on this pod as a guest someday. And then he can, uh, elucidate you on, on what's going on at Rangers and whether it is Gerard or not. Nice, nice, nice. Um, okay. Uh, let's see, by the way, uh, I'm, I'm following Twitter live while we are doing this. Uh, and I just want to update something that you heard earlier in the show uh -oh. there, uh, the supporters shield foundation that we talked about earlier in MLS and, and all the kerfuffle going on with that has said that they are currently holding meetings with supporters group representatives about the original decision, which we, which we said was to not award the supporters shield in light of new information and feedback we have received. That means that everybody screamed and yelled. Uh, and a public update will be forthcoming. So I, I wouldn't be surprised. We are going to have the supporter show. They wouldn't. They wouldn't yeah, put this. I out wouldn't there be surprised if they say we have we have seen the error of our ways and we have made a change uh, based on the input that we have uh, have gotten. But who knows? It might happen before the end of this show. It might happen later. But if you're listening to it right now, it might have already happened. So who knows? But anyway, I want to make sure that uh, uh, that we said that. All right. Uh, next question, Mossy. At N Surrey 20, if you were trying to explain to an outsider who doesn't know much about soccer, how would you describe why Champions League is more important to players than the global phenomenon that is the World Cup? Well, I, I disagree with your premise. Um, I don't necessarily think that that is true when it comes to all players. It depends. Uh, it depends who you are playing for. Um, it depends both the national team and the club situation that, uh, that you are in. I think that from a from a, a purely um, pure competitive side that I think people recognize Champions League as the highest level um, and therefore the most that you can do on a club level and it is and it is and it is looked at as the highest competitive level because you are playing against the best teams in the world that aren't national teams and therefore these are teams that are drilled day in and day out and with that comes an understanding and a coordination that you don't have when it comes to the international game so that that in and of itself would be a reason why a player would look at a champions league medal as as something as their ultimate accomplishment okay but i think that there are others a Champions League medal, first off, it's yearly, okay? I think it is much more fleeting. And I'm not, look, I'm not, if you've won a Champions League, well done. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty impressive. But I think it is much more fleeting than winning a World Cup. If, if, you, if you win a Champions League, you are remembered, okay? But if you win a World Cup, you are revered. Um, and I think your place in history is much different. You are written about and seen much differently winning a World Cup as opposed to winning a, um, a Champions League. So I don't even necessarily, as I said, think that that is the case when it comes, uh, when it comes to all players. Um, and, and you can't discount 
that when when you're playing when you're winning a champions league it's your profession you are doing it oftentimes it relate it relates to your contract it relates to more money it relates to more opportunity all of that kind of stuff factors in in a very different way than when you are playing uh internationally and so your legacy is can be much more um effective uh, and impactful and lasting and your your mythology for that matter doing it in a world cup as opposed to a uh, a champions league is that fair mossy i don't i don't know maybe maybe perception or uh, sentiment has changed when it comes to uh, this generation of players that's an interesting question it probably varies from country to country if you ask different players what they'd rather win uh, we should say the uh, champions league group stage this season gets underway this upcoming week and, and, you know, the, the schedule is really condensed because they have to get through this in a shorter period of time. So you have three straight weeks of Champions League action. Then there is a break in November. There's an international break uh, that interrupts it. But then match days four, five, and six are also in consecutive weeks so they can get everything done before the end of the year. Uh, and the final this season is in Istanbul, which is where it was supposed to be this past uh, campaign. But obviously they had to move it to do the Lisbon bubble. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, I, I love this competition. Looking forward to it. Some of the games that have my attention this week. Uh, Alex Dowd's Chelsea host your Europa League winner, Sevilla, uh, which uh, if you followed the Europa League last season, it's it very, uh, Sevilla, very unchanged. Uh, the, the one significant change was Banega out and Rakitic in, but otherwise it's the same guys, although uh, they're very good young French center back. Koundé, I guess, is a major doubt for this game. So that's good news for Chelsea because he is terrific. You also have PSG hosting Manchester United. Now, both teams with some key misses there. Uh, Verratti is out, and Marquinhos is a major doubt for PSG, while Harry Maguire out from Manchester United. And Edinson Cavani did not even travel, which is so funny to me because when he signed for Manchester United, I read all these articles that this game was the reason he chose United. He had circled this on the calendar. He's so annoyed at the way he was treated by PSG that he wanted to go back to Paris and stick it to them, match they won of the Champions League. And now he's not even involved because he's not fit yet. He hasn't trained much. He had to be in quarantine. So, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> it's he wants funny. no part of that. He wants. Uh, no yeah, no. And by the way, this is a big revenge game for PSG because a couple of seasons ago, United knocked them out in stunning circumstances in the round of 16. They had lost two 0 at Old Trafford, and then they they went back and won three one at the Parc des Princes. So Rashford converted a late penalty to send United through. So um, then you know you've also got uh, Bayern Atletico, which is fun. Atletico now Luis Suarez leading the line, so it's a great clash of center forwards here with Lewandowski and Luis Suarez. And then a game I'm really looking forward to, Ajax host Liverpool. Ajax have this very talented young Brazilian, Anthony, who's off to a great start to life there. And I'm excited to see him go up against a Virgil van Dijk-less Liverpool back line. We'll start to get a sense here of what Liverpool are going to look yeah. like without van Dijk back there. Uh, yeah, I mean, lots of other good games. Lazio Dortmund. Um, I mean, are you, are you excited for the, the Champions League being back? I am. Uh, and, and, you know, I mentioned uh, the Twitter machine firing up over here. Uh, I always know when... <laughs> when Fox Soccer has tweeted something that I'm involved with because my mentions start to blow up as they have here because our predictions that we made last pod, I think, um, as to what's what's going to happen have just started to filter out here. And, you know, so I'm getting stuff like um, you need to be drug tested. Uh <laughs> Well, you picked you picked Ren. Uh, yeah, so the Ren people aren't happy. Or the Ren people are happy, but other people aren't happy. That so seems there's to be the, the usual one that's that. generating the most reaction. Yeah, and, and Ren, I mentioned this last week. They have one of the most exciting young players in the world. This Eduardo Camavinga. So very excited to watch him in the Champions League. They open up against Krasnodar. Uh, you have uh, Jesse Marsh at Salzburg uh, face Lokomotiv Moscow. So uh, yeah, uh, tons of stuff to watch. Uh, tons of good games. An interesting one. Uh, Andrea Pirlo goes up against the manager that gave him his Serie A debut when he was 16, Mircea Luchescu, who is now in charge of Dinamo Kiev, was the Shakhtar coach for many years. He's the guy that brought all those Brazilians to Shakhtar. I'll, I'll tell that story on a different day. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's a neat little sort of subplot there of Pirlo going up against the manager that gave him his start. So uh, yeah, the Champions League is back. You can fire up the music, CBS, Kate Abdo. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. All right. All right. Uh, one more. We got one more right here, right? Yep, and we'll end on this at uh, Monteith underscore Alex. Uh, you tweeted about moving the 2022 World Cup back to 2023. Why? Okay, so uh, a few weeks ago, I think we talked about the, the potential and the possibility of having 
a year uh, move when it comes to the 22 Men's World Cup, which we all know is happening November, December of 22 in Qatar, and moving it back a year to uh, November, December of 2023. And the reason why I said that should be in play and a potential um, move is because of the, the bottleneck that is coming. Uh, we have kicked this can, I know there's some cans and bottles, but we've kicked this can down the road and we have, uh, you know, made an incredibly congested 2021 next year. Uh, and that will roll over into 2022. And there's only so many games that players can play. Um, and we don't know what 2021 is going to look like. Fingers crossed, best case type of scenario types of things, um, you know, on paper, all of that, we, we think it's going to be better uh, and we think there might be a, a return, but we don't know. So we might be kicking cans again in 2021. Now, no action that you that you take doesn't have a, a reaction um, and consequences, some intended, some not. Uh, obviously, the 2023 Women's World Cup is in the summer of 2023. So that would mean two World Cups coming five months apart, one in the summer in the women's uh, and then one in the winter with the men's. Is that ideal? No, none of this is ideal. None of this is fair. This is, as we've said all along, just making a crap situation and trying to make uh, the best of it. But at some point, it's gonna come back to roost. At some point we are going to have to pay the piper in terms of this congestion. So to the extent that you can find ways to alleviate some pressure and make decisions that we recognize not everybody's going to like and may pose other challenges along the way, you're gonna to have to do it. And there's, these are hard decisions uh, to be made. Now, when it comes to the Women's World Cup, would that take the year and obviously the attention and the shine off of the Women's World Cup? Yeah, maybe. I think you can do two World Cups that, that far apart um, and, and still have both of them be successful. I, I, I honestly think uh, that you can. Like I said, it's not ideal, but that's one of the reasons why, you know, we've been talking about Champions League. We've been talking about Gold Cup. We've been talking about the Olympics that have been pushed back. We've been talking about every league that was pushed and pulled and everything. Um, you know, this, this is not going to get any easier from a scheduling perspective. And so I still think some things need to be, uh, need to be looked at uh, going forward. So that was, that was why I was thinking about it. And in no way am I claiming that this is the, the, the cure-all and, and solves all of the problems, but some of that congestion is going to have to be relieved and some sort of decision is going to be, have to be made. Otherwise you're gonna have so many games uh, day after day after day. And you are in a sense diluting those games. And the biggest thing for FIFA are the World Cups. Um, obviously the Men's World Cup from a, a revenue and financial perspective is, is massive and certainly much bigger than the women's, but those are two huge, huge properties. And you wanna make sure that having them doesn't dismantle or destroy other stuff that you have. OK, so that was you know, one of the solutions uh, going forward. I don't know if it ultimately ends up being something that is ever considered. And certainly, uh, as I've said, it, it won't be considered if it's coming from an American. <laughs> That's just the reality. So somebody else out there, uh, throw it. Mossy, anything else? Uh, that is it. Although one last little note. Uh, yeah, sure. Do you know what uh, enters my life again uh, this upcoming weekend? No, what? Michigan football. I do actually. I do know this. Uh, I I was uh, at at uh, I did some uh, some testing this morning, you know, in order to keep us all safe at Fox because we're working this week. And I uh, I was with my uh, my friend Rob Stone, also uh, involved in that. So he's gearing up uh, along with his college football crew to get ready for the return of uh, the Big Ten. As are a lot of people out there, including my Ohio State. Um, supporting uh, wife who was all fired up about uh, the return nine weeks evidently nine games one after the other bam 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 uh and hopefully everybody stays safe 
throughout the, uh, you know, on the field and off the field as they go through this, uh, uh, go through this thing. But uh, I'm actually excited too. Are you excited? I am. Yeah. We open up at Minnesota, which is not an easy game. So uh, Jim Harbaugh. <laughs> I'm picking Rutgers. Okay. Uh, I'm picking Wren and Rutgers. <laughs> Those are my picks. Those are my picks. Uh, are you? I love it. I love it. All right. Anything else, Mossy? That's it. All right. We're going to take one more break here. When we come back, I'm going to give you my uh, one for the road. Don't go anywhere. All right. Welcome back. Uh, this is my one for the road this week. And uh, I'm sorry. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not a good story. It's a sad story. Um, there are good parts of it uh, that will become apparent. Uh, if you are a listener of this podcast, uh, you will know from, uh, previous episodes, I've talked about, uh, the troubles that, uh, my good friend, Daryl Grove is going through. Uh, for those that don't know, Daryl Grove is part of our soccer community, uh, and certainly part of our soccer podcasting community. He is one of the co-hosts of the total soccer show, which is a show that has been, uh, in my ears, Gosh, since it started back in 2009, I think, well, over a decade. Uh, these are two gentlemen that immerse themselves, uh, much like us, in the game of soccer and view it from an American uh, perspective. Uh, Daryl is a transplanted uh, uh, Englishman, and uh, he has come over to the United States and, as I said, immersed himself and is incredible in terms of the way that he uh, has talked about the game on and off the field and how in depth and how much content they have been able to produce over there when it comes to the total soccer show. As I mentioned in, uh, in previous podcasts over the last two years, uh, he's been battling cancer. Uh, he was diagnosed with, uh, liver and colon cancer. And, uh, unfortunately he was, uh, in the hospital and was sent home to, uh, start hospice care, uh, over the last couple of days. So it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not good news when it comes, uh, to Daryl, but, uh, you know, I wanted to talk just really briefly about him as it relates to that American soccer community and that American soccer family. And it is, and it is a family. It's a, it's a family that is, you know, started small, but has grown incredibly big. And Daryl is as much a part of it as anybody out there that, has kicked a ball or not. And, um, you know, he is, he is one of our own. And what has always amazed me and what I've always loved about, uh, about Daryl, um, is his willingness to listen, um, and his genuine curiosity about this curious thing that we call the American soccer, uh, community. And I, and I've said many, many times, I said it earlier on this podcast, we are a funny bunch. Um, we are at times an incredibly frustrating uh, community. We do things to ourselves um, and to others that don't always put us in the best light and don't always head us in the right direction. We fight like families, uh, like families do. We lose perspective, oftentimes like families and people of, of passion do. But, you know, this is, this is someone who has fought for the game. This is someone in doing so that has bettered the game. This is someone who has made my life better. Um, and obviously the game of soccer better by the work that he has done. Some of you will know it. Some of you won't. Some of you never will know it. And that's okay. There are plenty of people in our soccer tent that you don't necessarily know. But whether you realize it or not, they have made the world of soccer in the United States better. And Daryl Grove, Grove certainly has, uh, has done that. And I'm sending my, uh, my thoughts and my prayers uh, and my thanks and my love to him and to his family. I'm happy that he is with his family right now, including family that evidently is coming over from England uh, to be with him. And uh, that while not there, um, I hope that he knows that that extended family that is the American soccer community is with him and is thinking about him as we go on. And, you know, his love and his passion and his curiosity um, and his spirit that has always been a hallmark of the way that he has talked about the game, uh, hopefully will continue on uh, and hopefully will be a part of everything that we, uh, that we do, because sometimes we do get bogged down 
uh, and we do lose track of the fact that it is just soccer. And it's something that we love. It's something that we have a passion for. In many of our cases, it's, it's our living, but it's still just a game of soccer. And um, ultimately the game of soccer isn't about the ball. The game of soccer is about the people. And uh, Daryl Grove is one of those special people in the game. And so uh, if you do have a moment and you are so inclined, uh, keep him and his family uh, in your thoughts. Mossy, um, we'll talk again uh, next week. Anything you want to say before we go, my friend? That's it. All right. Thank you for uh, everybody for listening and for downloading and for reviewing and for subscribing, uh, for sending us all of your Ask Alexi and Ask Mossy questions out there on all the different machines out there. Uh, I hope that you're staying safe. I hope that you are staying sane. I hope that you are with and surrounded by people that, uh, that love and respect you. And um, here's to much better days ahead. All right. We will talk again uh, next week. And as always, size the day. You like that clip? Well, my State of the Union podcast drops every week. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.